Welcome to World Domination. Disclaimer, the views expressed in this episode are for comedic effect. They should not be taken as advice, as opinions held by the people saying them, or before bedtime. No whales were harmed in the making of this production, though I can assure you one of them certainly thought about it. What are we doing tonight? The same thing we do every night. Try and take over the world. Are you guys sure you know what you're doing? (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to World Domination, everyone. I'm your host, Jimmy Boy, a.k.a. The Tuxedo. The Tuxedo, no! (laughs) Oh, how do I even follow that? Are you the Jackie Chan of this podcast? Is that what's happening? I, I, I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> Does that make this Ken um, I'm Jennifer, Jennifer Love, Love Hewitt? <laughs> <laughs> Done. All right, Ken, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I am um, Kenneth Love Hewitt. Excellent. No, I am I'm host Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I question my life every every time we record one of these. And I'm Emma, and welcome back to another week. <laughs> back, um, thank you for putting up with, with us so far So today we're talking about biological warfare And there's been a little bit of discussion about this uh, off air So I feel like we should probably be a little bit more specific about what we mean by that When we're talking about biological warfare in this episode We're generally talking about uh, the use of germ agents But that's not entirely specific So we might dabble in some other things at other parts of the episode But don't worry why, why are they worrying? I don't know, <laughs> Just... people worry. Sometimes, sometimes people fret. <laughs> don't fret, listeners. It's okay. All right, let's get on with the show, okay. shall we? So should we move on to real life examples? Let's do it. Mm. So one of the ones that I, when I was doing a bit of research on this, that came up to me was the about the Scythian archers. So back in the, I think they were... Um, hundreds of years ago but they actually dipped their arrows in a mixture of blood and horse dung it was at least 10 years ago I'll tell you that much. <laughs> at, oh. least, at least 10 i mean they're still using uh um, bow and arrow so I feel like it was at least 10 years ago um but yeah um dipped in horse dung and blood so to make every shot count so was it horse blood as well I, I don't know. I don't. It just the internet just told me blood. Okay. I mean, it, I wasn't it probably there. was blood. <laughs> could have been. It could have been horse blood. I'm not sure. Mm. But I think the um the idea around that was that there'd be shots that they would hit, but they wouldn't necessarily be lethal. So therefore, dip them in this bit of mixture there, and um it would cause an infection, which would spread. So hopefully considering back then they didn't really know how to fix these sorts of situations and treat these kinds of infections, that it would lead to death eventually. What is it with people from that part of the world and horse blood? (laughs) I can neither confirm nor deny whether it was horse blood. A tasty snack to the Mongols was horse blood and horse milk mixed together. Oh, that sounds... That's how they got big and strong. Oh god, protein, <laughs> maximum protein, maximum protein. But like that's the thing they had the most. They had land and they had um horses. Mm. 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 You know, they had lo- shit and they had horses. They had shit. <laughs> they had horse when shit. life gives you lemonade. <laughs> One came from the other. Yeah, I think Mongols are a good carry on from there. Like the Mongols yeah. did a lot of weird things with biological warfare. Like they used to. That like there's some speculation that they're the ones that introduced the Black Death. Like bubonic plague to europe oh that's right yeah i feel that yeah because what they used to like um people they would find people that died of the bubonic plague because Mo- bubonic plague comes from mongolia comes from like gophers that live in mongolia <laughs> um and what they would do is they would find people that died of that they would cut their heads off put that in a catapult and then launch that into a city that they were trying to invade yeah but how do they how do they stop themselves from getting it well, presumably they had some immunity to it because they'd grown up around it. Like, it's from Mongolia. Ah, oh, the early vaccine. Yeah. Mm. Okay, right. Like, I, I don't know for sure, but, like, presumably they might have had some immunity to it. Or also, they just handled it really carefully, maybe. <laughs> they, they created... Uh, maybe it was all that horse blood and... <laughs> oh, made them nice and strong. <laughs> you know, that known was... for their fastidious cleanliness, yeah. the Mongols. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. Ken, you got one? No. Oh, I was thinking, yeah, because they, the, well, just leading on from that, I think they used it on a, a at a port. And basically the historians believe that the uh, ships returned from that port to Italy and uh, the Black Death started spreading from there. Yeah. Mm. 
Goddamn Mongolians. <laughs> Mongolians. Goddamn Mongolians. But I mean, around around the world, they didn't really help themselves. I mean, I think it wasn't until um, the 19th century, I think, that washing your hands in hospitals and things like that, and when dealing with people with infections and, and this sort of thing, actually came into practice. So mm-hmm. I feel like people didn't really help themselves or, you know, digging um, toilet trenches right next to drinking water. And like yeah. not actually being able to say that, oh, possibly that's not the greatest idea. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> we didn't help ourselves. Fun fact, the guy who tried to get doctors to wash their hands now has Listerine named after him. His name was Joseph Lister. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, how about instead of like taking a crap and then going and conducting surgery, we wash our hands in between those two things. And what? His, his contemporaries were like, that's madness. Madness. <laughs> To the asylum. They kicked him out of the medical profession and he died broken alone. No, that poor guy. Yeah, but now he has Listerine named after him, so... (laughs) It's a high honor. Look out, world. Thank you, Mr. Mm. Lister. (laughs) It's Dr. Lister to you. Sorry. Actually, no, I don't even think it was. I think he lost his medical license. I was going to say, it probably got stripped of him when he was dying broken alone. Hmm. Uh, Poor guy. All right. Um... So oh, another. I want. I don't want to say good example because it's a horrible plan. It's an ex- you know, It's it, an example. It is an example. <laughs> let's say that instead. And it just has the coolest name ever, Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night, um, which was a, a Japanese plan towards the end of the Second World War when they were kind of running out of ideas and money. <laughs> um, and the plan was to take a submarine. Funnily enough. Japan had submarine aircraft carriers. They could only carry one plane, but they still had submarine (laughs) aircraft carriers. Good enough. Yeah. And so the plan was to take one of these submarines right up to the the coast of the US and then launch the plane that was carrying bombs filled with fleas that had plague, like diseases inside them, and then drop those over cities like San Diego. (laughs) Why San Diego? I mean, I guess it's it's on the water. I think it's just because it was close. (laughs) Like, it's just on the water. They just they just love the water, don't they? They do. Bloody Pearl Harbor, San Diego. Mm-hmm. Mm. Sorry, when I... you said launch uh, the planes, I thought... Drop you... would yeah. be a better idea. Yeah, no, I thought, I thought you meant like launch because I was just thinking of like catapults. So I was thinking, oh, they're launching <laughs> the planes over. Planes don't fly themselves, they get launched. <laughs> it's my cunning new invention, the plane-mounted catapult. Because it's, it's interesting when like talking about the Japanese, because I know, um, I think it was back in 1925, um, but there was all of the the powers at bay across the world were kind of like realising the, the devastation that harboring these kinds of biological weapons could cause. So they um, signed this protocol for prohibition of the use in asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and of bacteriological methods of warfare. And nobody ever used them again. No, the Japanese realise, hold on a second, if they're actually signing this, maybe there's something to learn here. So they <laughs> refused to sign it and then started this plot to to creating all of these things and experimented on Chinese, British, Australian and American um, prisoners of war. Ooh, damn. Um, but then I think that kind of led into their Operation Cherry Blossoms. It's sa- like It sounds pretty. But it's not. Yeah, it should be said. I chose Operation Cherry Blossoms at night because it had the coolest sounding name. They'd been doing the exact same thing to China for years. Yeah, yeah. Like the Operation Cherry Blossoms at night was a plan that didn't happen. They had been doing it to Japan, to China in real life for Ooh, years. Poor China. Damn, damn. I was thinking, uh, the was the 1925 uh, protocol, was that the Geneva Protocol? I think so. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I think so. I think it was. Yeah, because they did all this stuff after they got sneaky and tried to do all that stuff. Because it only stops people from using biological weapons, but it doesn't actually stop them from possessing or developing them. So that's the loophole that Japan went through. No. <laughs> don't, don't, don't defend Japan here. Don't defend but, them. <laughs> yeah, but no, they uh, closed up that little loop when they uh, signed the... The second one. Yeah, the second one. What's it called? <laughs> Geneva Protocols <laughs> 2. 2.0. The Revenge. <laughs> the Revengening. <laughs> so, you know, the uh, Biological Weapons Convention. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that one that was signed in 1972. Gee, that, it only took them, what, 30 years <laughs> to get around to fixing that? No rush. It's fine. You know, uh, whatever. Whatever. But 
I guess, like, leading off from World War II, these aren't strictly germ warfare, but they're, they're just so entertaining to talk about the way that they used animals as weapons in World yeah. War II. Yeah. And, like, uh, Operation Cherry Blossoms at night used fleas to carry the plague around. But there were also just some excellent larger animal weapons. <laughs> Can I just point out, you and I have very different ideas of what's you know, <laughs> entertaining and exciting. <laughs> okay, well, perhaps those are the wrong words, but you know, interesting, horrifying. Yep, uh, yep. Horrifying. So, devastating. The Soviets developed an anti-tank dog. <laughs> so during World War II, the Russians needed a way to combat German tanks, which were like one of the Germans' best weapons in the war. And because the armor on a tank is thinnest underneath they decided that the best way would be to be to get something underneath the tank and then use that to explode it rather than try and hit it from the side because when you try and hit it from the side there's a lot of armor there wait 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 you're telling me anti-tank dogs aren't tank sized dogs no they're dog sized dogs okay that <laughs> funny that very very disappointing so what kind of what kind of dogs are we talking here are we talking like, whatever remember? strays we... they could find on the side of the road we're we talking like, like little two hours that are small enough to get under are we no talking they would like... be mostly mutts that would be just like oh. whatever they found on the street so that's Aww. just devastating like it's it's a clever plan like i get it and in more time anything goes i guess but, but here's just, the kicker come on. they only used it once because there was a fatal flaw in their plan what they did was they trained the dogs to crawl underneath the tank and they had a little stick on their back then when they crawled under the under the tank the stick would get pushed down and detonate the bomb mm -hmm. yep. but they only had russian tanks to train the dogs on they didn't have a german tank to train them on <laughs> oh, oh. so when they when they released the dogs into the battlefield the dogs ran straight for the russians tanks <laughs> no. crawled under and exploded them <laughs> no which meant the Russians had to shoot their own dogs oh. as they were running towards the Russian tanks. That's even more devastating. Oh, I know. No. Oh. But they only did that once. I mean, <laughs> are Actually, the tanks, I mean, I don't know much about tanks, but are they that different? Um, I think it was mostly to do with smell. Okay. Uh, like right. yeah, I mean, like yeah. to a dog, I, I imagine most tanks look like one another, but I imagine they smell quite different. Yeah, no, I was, yeah, I was wondering about, you know, like the, the size of the underneath and things like that. Maybe it was all like different, but yeah. I mean, how different can you really get with a tank? <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, about same sort of thing happened with something that the US was doing. Yeah. So the US, um, they did a lot of uh, napalm bombing of Japan because a lot of Japan's construction was like wood and paper based. Mm -hmm. uh, during World War II, this is. Um, <laughs> you mean they're not anymore? Not anymore. They, they, they don't tend to bomb Japan on a regular basis anymore. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. 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 It's been at least 10 years, is that what? Yeah, yep. at least 10 years yep. ago, yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, at least 10 so years ago, yes. They, they wanted to come up with a more efficient way of getting the napalm to the Japanese. So they came up with this idea of making little napalm waistcoats for bats <laughs> and then dropping them out of a plane. And the idea was the bats would roost like in the rafters of these Japanese buildings and then... After a couple of hours, little timers in their little waistcoats would go off and the napalm would explode. I'm, I'm just imagining these these um, bats in little tuxedos. Yeah. But yeah, also, I love, the, I love the way that you, you described it as getting the napalm to them. It's just, <laughs> just hey guys, a here's, friendly here's, gift. here's this napalm that you ordered. We thought you might like it. <laughs> oh, I love the smell of it in the morning. Um, but here's the kicker. So to test it, they built this fake Japanese city out in the middle of the desert somewhere in America. As you do. Um, and they flew these bats over the city, the fake city, and they dropped them over. But the bats didn't know where they were, so they flew back to the airplane hangar where they'd started from and burnt <laughs> that down instead. <laughs> oh. I don't know whether... I feel like these animals are, are smarter they than are we give them credit smart. for. They're like, nah, fuck you. <laughs> How dare you use me for this? I'm going to take you out. Oh, um, so those were very limited use. There was one that um, didn't actually get used, but funnily enough forms the basis for how we like study pokey machine addiction and gambling addiction. Hmm. Pokey machine. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. the US had uh, plane launched missiles that would like target Japanese ships or German ships in the ocean. But because, you know, these weren't terribly accurate when you accurate when you launch them normally. And because boats are a moving target, they needed some way to guide the bomb into the boat as it was like coming in. Yeah. 
and you can't put a human on there you know radio control wasn't a thing yet um you couldn't have like a wire and a camera or whatever because it was too far so what they decided to do was they were going to put a pigeon in the front and they trained these pigeons to peck at little pictures of boats <laughs> <laughs> so in the lab they would train these mm. pigeons to peck at boats and then in the in the real missile there would be a little screen and wherever the pigeon tapped that would be where the the boat was and so it had little guiding fins that would turn the, the missile depending on where the pigeon tapped on the screen oh okay but the way they trained these pigeons forms the basis of how we understand gambling addiction right so they worked, so like if you imagine training an animal, you can do um, like positive and negative conditioning where positive, you give a treat or a reward every time the animal does something you want it to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you can do negative conditioning where you do, you give it a punishment every time it does something you don't want it to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this, because some of this pigeon stuff came from Skinner, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So B.F. Skinner yeah. was the one who like designed <laughs> this missile or at least designed the training method for the pigeons. And so he worked out that, if you gave the treat or the reward randomly, you could get way more involvement from the pigeon. Oh. You could get you could get them to peck endlessly if you get, if you gave the reward randomly. Right. Okay. Oh God. I get you. Because that's the, that's the thing with poking poking machines, which is why I never go on them. Um, is because it, there's no skill involved. Absolutely none. Speak no. for yourself. No, no it's, it's not a skill. No skill. <laughs> nah, no skill. Yeah. Plus, pro tip for anyone there who's into the pokies, poke at least in Australia, pokey machines are legally mandated to only give out 90 cents on every dollar you put in. Also, another pro tip, get a life. Get a real job. <laughs> get a real <laughs> job. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's it, it's quite... Yeah, it's it's interesting because you do have to wonder about the people that come up with these plans, eh? And one, how high are they when they're coming up with them? <laughs> <laughs> There's a very thin line. You know how they say like a sign of being a serial killer is like killing animals when you're young? Yeah. What is like training animals to like peck at a screen to kit, like blow up boats? What does that say about your character? A serial trainer. Next level. Probably a very manipulative person. <laughs> Imagine his poor wife. <laughs> Ken sounds like he's really, really worried about himself there or something. Oh, no. He's, th he's thinking about, he drifts off and starts talking quietly. <laughs> Who am I? Should we be worried about you, Ken? Ken's thinking about how he can train his mum with operant conditioning. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait, no, it's okay. She, she doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> your sister might, though. Oh, God. So your plan can still go ahead? Is that what you're meaning? I'm definitely not going to condition you, my lovely sister. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like one of us should really like go up to your sister and try a bunch of like code words on her just to like try and snap her out of it. Oh God. No, just, like, no, no, no. Mahogany. Oh no, no, no. Oh, wait, no. Oh, no. Wrong tree. Wrong tree. All good. All good guys. It'll definitely be cat girl or something. <laughs> Whoa. I would not do that to my sister. That's too commonly used in this household. Why? Because you talk. Yeah, I was going to say, because you use it exactly. too often. Yeah. <laughs> There has been consistent mention of Catgirl every single time we record this podcast. I think that's a tradition we keep. Oh, I hate damn it, myself. It's a biological it. weapon today. Oh, I should have included Catgirls in my plan. I hate myself. They are a biological weapon, Ken. They More are. Always than one. Oh, exactly. God. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the dominating rating. The dominating rating. Um, so funnily enough, there's not like that many movies about this sort of thing i felt yeah i feel i feel like i mean considering this week we tried to shorten it down to to looking at i, I guess the the germ warfare side of it yeah there's actually not that that many i'm sure there's plenty more that people will come back to us with afterwards but so the first one we had on the list was uh kind of a shared title between the fantastic charlton heston vehicle the omega man and the lesser known will smith movie i am legend the lesser known <laughs> movie. Um, I will point out that the worst part about that movie, I Am Legend, and going back to our animal thing, is when that freaking dog died. It's like the only time in the movie where I actually cried and was genuinely <laughs> so sad. Oh, he'd been with him through it all. Like, I didn't give a shit when Will Smith died, but I cried like no. a goddamn baby. Whoa, Will Smith no, died? He, like, Will Smith died to save everything. Oh, okay. Well, save the 12 people that are left. I should watch that movie. So for those that haven't seen the movie, um, basically there is a virus that was originally created to cure cancer, um, has wiped out most of mankind. 
and Will Smith is basically, I think he worked in the lab and he's one of the last people living and he's trying to fight to find a, um, find a cure for it all. And there's no- nocturnal mutants and things like that that are running around that are, can't go in the sunlight. And so basically the story is about him trying to find the cure to bring people back from being mutants. And in the end, I think he sacrifices himself with a bomb or something like that. Um, I honestly can't remember. I think it's to, to, I think he's with a couple of people and to save that he's finally found the cure gives and to save the cure. He gives it to um, the lady and says, run. Um, He sacrifices himself as there's a whole bunch of mutants that have kind of um, found where they are. Um, Mm -hmm. And so she, he kills himself, kills all those ones that are there. And um, she runs off and takes the cure to a a sanctuary where there are a few other immune uh, people. people. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the storyline of it. And I think that like in the original book, I Am Legend, and in the Charlton Heston movie, The Omega Man, there's like some hint that the the virus is the, the result of some sort of war somewhere, or at least that the two were concurrent. Yeah. yeah. Like there was some war happening and then that's how it happened. Um, but I don't, I think you're right. I don't think that's the case in I Am, like the movie I Am Legend. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I, th- I think it was a, I mean, it was a great film. Do love me some Will Smith. Was there a happy ending at the end? Uh, like, did, look, did they show people being cured? I think from memory they show that she get they get the um they get to the sanctuary and stuff with the cure with the cure yeah, yeah so it's yeah. it rather than showing everybody being cured I think it's just like you just know that oh. they've got it now they're gonna yeah, yeah I'm okay with that yeah I can sleep tonight I really think you should watch the Omega Man because the I don't know what you call them they call them ghouls I think in the Omega Man ghouls. <laughs> And they're, they're completely lucid. Like, the virus just turns them evil. It doesn't make them crazy mutants. Oh, wow. So they're, they're still, like, lucid, and they, like, talk with dark voices. Of course Ooh. they do. It's great. Charlton Heston, like, it's, it's a boss. Evil people talk with deep voices. They dress like vampires and have, like, cloaks. It's great. <laughs> they sound really cool. <laughs> I just thought it was 1971. I've just looked it up. Although the name sounds familiar as well. I think it's the same name. For the um, because it was so Doctor Neville, is what um Will Smith's character name was. What yeah yeah they're both they're both based on I Am Legend the book. Interesting, cool. Oh okay. But so it where did the name the Omega Man come from then? I think they liked that like whatever studio produced it liked that name better than I Am Legend. Yeah righto. But like look at look at the fucking poster and look at those fucking boss. <laughs> <laughs> fucking vampire things. They're great. Oh, man. That looks like such a great film. So how do we rate this one? Thumbs up. Will Smith. Thumbs up? Big thumbs up. Will Smith? Yep. In tribute of the dog. <laughs> oh, in tribute of the dog. Oh, now I feel like the bad guy for giving a thumbs down. I give Charlton Heston and his toupee two <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> but you're basically creating, you know, a world, a world of, like, crazy mutants. Yeah, what's the end goal with both of these? Yeah, where's the end goal here? Like, you, you're not... You appreciate life more. Oh... The Omega Man, the Omega Man one seems to have a better take of the world vibe based on what I've heard from Jim. But uh, the um, the super violent mutants from I Am Legend don't sound like a desired outcome for anyone. I mean, look, I don't think it was a plan of anybody as they're trying oh. to cure cancer. <laughs> oh, good, good point. Good point. <laughs> they, they done goofed. But um, as as a movie and as a as an I guess an expression of biological war- warfare and oh. stuff, I think I think yes. yeah, well. very yeah. good. Yes, that's yeah. true. I wonder if those mutants have cancer. Maybe they're cured. Maybe they're all Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Maybe cancer doesn't exist anymore. But that Yay, is the, that is cured the downside cancer. to it. <laughs> the downside is we're all mutants. <laughs> Imagine going into like your performance review with your boss and you're like, so some good news and some bad news. Good news is I cured cancer. Bad news is everyone else is dead. So next one is 28 Days Later. I, you know, I haven't seen this movie in a good 10 years. All I remember, all I vaguely remember about it is the dude waking up in the hospital. Yeah. So from memory, it has... Not quite 10 years, but it's been a while since I've seen it. But I think it's a bunch of um, animal activists that f- attempt to free chimpanzees from a from a lab that are infected with the virus. Oh, yeah. And then that <laughs> bloody unleashes it upon the world because once they... I think it's like a rage-inducing rage virus or something virus, like that. Yes. Um, and then once that's obviously unleashed to the world... Uh, Britain gets fucked up and then yeah I think he wakes up and I think he's one of them and he wakes up in the hospital a few days later and then comes out and is like oh 
Right. Yeah, the world's the world's gone to shit. I think this movie is a good example of how our threshold for innovation has changed over the last 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Like, remember when this movie came out and everyone was like, oh my God, it's so innovative. The zombies can run. <laughs> As opposed to being like, just like crawling. Like shambling masses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Helen, did you see the new movie? The zombies can move fast now. <laughs> no one is safe. Oh my Who God, Who are you impersonating Helen? there? I don't even know. <laughs> I'd like to speak to your manager, <laughs> Helen. I think overall, like it's it's a good movie, um, and I I think from a regard of animal activists and things like that, I mean, in the world that we're kind of living in now, and you know the the vegan uprising and all of that kind of thing. I, <laughs> I mean, it really... seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. No, more more from a side that you know people are becoming a lot more aware of of that sort of thing. Not that they weren't back then but uh, vegans ve- vegans i'm sure they were no but more <laughs> more from an animal um liberation kind of activist that sort of thing mm. um but i think obviously and how that will be the end of all of us <laughs> no. like i'm hoping that you know labs aren't doing tests on and like on viruses and things like that on animals i'm sure possibly Ooh, some are in some countries they probably are um oh they for sure are <laughs> but you know i'd like to think not but i the fact of the how I guess in my mind if we're kind of rating it on the how it all happened, it's not far out of the norm, like all mm. out of the the realm of possibility in the regard of activists attempting to free chimpanzees and then shit goes wrong. Mm. So I guess from that it seems realistic. Everything afterwards, eh, not so much. Okay, so how do we rate this one? Well, similar to my uh, review of I Am Legend, I'm thinking ah. Oh. Rage virus, you know, everyone goes crazy and angry and, you know, beats each other up. Oh, actually, that's pretty good in terms of, like, breaking down society. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know. Like, if your goal was to be the last person standing, it's not a bad way to do it. Yeah, exactly. Eh, I'm still a bit iffy on, like, you know, the results. But, you know, like, good in terms of, um, you know, realisticness and spreading of viruses, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I give it a thumbs up for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Look, it's not my favourite movie. But I think from a regard of talking about the plan, or not really that it was a plan, but how it all unfolded, I'd give it a thumbs up as well. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I'd also give it a thumbs up. Okay. So next one, I don't think there's been a movie made of this one, but I think they might be in the works for it. But I know there was a TV miniseries, um, a Stephen King book called The Stand. Yep. Um, so do, have you guys like read or know anything about this one? I know I know a little bit. I do know that the mini series starred Molly Ringwald. Did it? Yeah, it did. Mm. Hang on, let me write that down. <laughs> um I watch a... the stand <laughs> mini series. Did Molly Ringwald sell it for you? Sorry, what? Did Molly Ringwald sell it for you? <laughs> like no that... comment. <laughs> Who's Molly Ringwald? Let me look her up. Uh, classic. The girl from 16 Candles in The Breakfast Club? Yep. Uh, which girl from The Breakfast Club? The redhead. Oh, the non-emo one. Sold. Yeah, so do you guys know anything about the plot of this one? Do you want me to run through it a little bit? I had a friend who Happy um, to run through. kept telling me uh, about all the horrifying bits of The Stand. And basically, it, it starts with... <coughs> <clears throat> That's all I know. It starts with... <laughs> you, you're not wrong there. <laughs> um, it does start with the, the black lung. No, it starts with uh, this biological weapons research facility somewhere in the US, I can't remember where. Somebody gets infected and they flee the site and like try and go home. And in doing so, they kind of release the virus into the world. And it's really like... Like Stephen King must be into some weird sexual shit because he spends like a good couple of hundred pages talking about how every single person in the world dies. Ooh. <laughs> Stephen King, he was hopped up on. Oh, that's right. 99.4% of the world population. Yeah, and he spends like a good couple of hundred pages going through how a lot of them die. Cocaine will do that to you, Jim. Oh, yeah, c- cocaine will do Drugs that are a hell of a drug. Yeah. I heard like each um, Stephen King book is a different drug. Uh, I think this, like I've said this before and I'll say it again. Cocaine should be given the co-author credit for a lot of Stephen King's books. 100%. Co-author cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Full disclosure, I never made it through all of this book because I found it too depressing. I thought you you were going to say you never made it through this whole book because you found cocaine. Don't do drugs, kid. 
kids. I feel like that would have made me get through the book faster, if anything. But yeah, so... We're not endorsing cocaine here, all right? Move along. So th- there's there's two aspects that you can go go down with the world domination path with, with the stand. So the first path is, you know, the biological weapons part. But that in the book, that's all kind of a prelude to this big kind of good versus evil struggle that happens in the aftermath. So I guess you can kind of look at it in the fact that it's either, you know, world domination via biological weapons or world domination by reducing everyone else's capacity through biologic weapons and then taking over the world using a more conventional approach. Even though it's supernatural in the book, but ignore that. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we rate the stand? Look, I am I am a Stephen King fan, so I feel like that's kind of <laughs> helping it out here a little bit. I, I I mean I haven't I haven't read it, I haven't watched the mini series, but I guess from the research that I did and kind of what we've what we've discussed already, I'd I'd give it a thumbs up. Mm. Kind of like a three quarter thumbs up, I guess. Yeah, I'm a numbers guy, so, you know, 99.4% of the world population, thumbs up, definitely. For killing 99.4% of the world's population? Yeah, yeah that's scary. Oh, you're a closet dickhead, aren't you? No, I mean, like, you'd have to, like, give credit <laughs> to the effectiveness of this virus. I think that, like, the, the idea of it all, and I guess from a biological perspective, how it all happened, I guess it's a a good idea but possibly yes yeah, Stephen King is he's a bit intense so I, I get that too <laughs> it's an understatement <laughs> of the century I know okay so the next one it's not a movie but it is kind of I don't know whether we, we're counting this one or not as like biological warfare or not but we're going with the flood from the Halo games or at least the first three Halo games mm-hmm. have either of you two played Halo yeah my brother and I used to play it all the time rad mm. Ken I played it a bit didn't re- I didn't um, play the story mode that much. I played a little bit of the story mode, but I was mostly playing the um, play it PvP part of it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's all anybody really cares about <laughs> with Halo anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, for anyone who doesn't know, the Flood are this kind of alien parasite that come in. They come in little spores that kind of attach to your body and then turn you into a zombie. And then they they become kind of like a hive mind that takes over planets and then develops their own like spore, not ships, I guess, but like spore things that they can send out to other planets. But they, they kind of work by like taking over planets by like zombifying everyone. It's some gross shit. <laughs> like be glad that they didn't have great like graphical gross, rendering yeah. capabilities in the early 2000s because that's some <laughs> gross shit to like see up close. Ugh, yucky, yucky. <laughs> Although, if you're a fan of Stephen King, maybe that's what you're into. <laughs> the Flood are a good... They're a good zombie... It's like a slight twist on the zombie archetype in that they're more of a hive mind. They're just kind of a shambling horde. Yeah. I... Look, I'm just going to throw this out there now. I'll give it a thumbs down. It's a fun game to play back in the day. I did enjoy the odd game with my brother here and there. But, um, yeah, no. The whole storyline kind of thing no Ooh. no no not a fan oh man i recently replayed all the halo games in like one week <laughs> <sighs> what a life you lived times. Jim. oh what I a live life. an exciting life i completely missed the story mode of the game so um, i'm assuming execution is a bit of a thumbs down but in terms of effectiveness of plan a great thumbs up like them as yeah. a species completely infecting everything is amazing Mm-hmm. And uh, in the end, they have to use, uh, you know, this is based on my research as well. They have to use like the halo, um, which is uh, a weapon that destroys all of their food, uh, their yeah. food source. Doesn't destroy the flood. Yep. Destroys what they eat, yep. people. Yep. <laughs> ja, that, like that, you know, it requires that level of means to uh, eradicate it. And it still mm-hmm. doesn't do the whole job. Mm-hmm. How crazy is that? It's dumb. Mm. It's a dumb plan for dealing with them. But I... Yeah, that's what I said. Thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> yep, thumbs now down. Now they're both down. Now that we've oh. dragged on about it, they're both down. Oh, no. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but you know, one, one movie that does sort of speak volumes is um, and goes outside of the, the realm of the sameness, The Tuxedo. What a, yes. what a great film. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic film. Um, so The Tuxedo is I had completely forgotten about it. I imagine the rest of the world has completely forgotten about it. It's a a Jackie Chan film from the early 2000s that also stars Jennifer Love Hewitt. Woo! And Jason Isaacs, apparently? Yeah, he's the the guy um, at the very start. He's the original guy who's supposed to be wearing the tuxedo. Okay, so the plot of the movie is Jackie Chan is a taxi driver. 
<laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah, Jackie Chan is a taxi driver. That's all you need. Like, I'd watch that movie. 100%. Who starts working for a secret agent played by Jason Isaacs. And Jason Isaacs is so impressed by how well he drives that taxi that he gives him a job. <laughs> he does know how to drive a taxi. That Jackie uh-huh. Chan. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's some subterfuge and Jason Isaacs character gets incapacitated and Jackie Chan has to start wearing his uh, exosuit tuxedo mm-hmm. that like can do things like karate punch real good Woo! and dance real good and make make you smoke a cigarette real good. <laughs> What is the difference between just smoking a cigarette and smoking it real good? You can get uh, biological weapons thrown in your mouth when you smoke the tuxedo with this suit. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, But Jackie Chan has to foil the plan of this, you know, evil organization that's trying to... um, Poison the the world's water supply. Yeah, they're using water boatmen, which is like a type of insect that can walk on water. Water strider. Yeah. Water striders. And they're using them who are carrying some sort of plague to like infect water supplies, I guess. But like, I don't know why water striders are necessary. Why couldn't you just put it in the water? Like if you had to go out there with the water striders and put them in the water, why couldn't you just put the thing in the water? Because it's less obvious. Oh, maybe because they float on water. So the uh, virus doesn't disperse in one spot. So maybe it just keeps crawling and it keeps like the virus keeps multiplying and you can do more places. Yeah, that's true, I guess. Yeah, rather than... And I guess it'd be harder to pick, yeah, where it started off or who who did it, unless mm-hmm. you're Jackie Chan and have a tuxedo. Um, but, so yeah, you're right. Those. Like, if they're doing it at different places and it kind of is all happening at the one time as opposed to if you put it in one, you know, one tube or whatever into the into the river, it's a bit easier to, to figure out where it's come from. Mm-hmm. See, there's a lot of thought. There's, there's just this movie. It's just timeless. Mm-hmm. Jackie so Chan, good. the so tuxedo, good. thumbs up. Mm-hmm. How are we giving? How are we rating the tuxedo? I give it, you know, the movie itself, thumbs up. Jackie Chan can get it. <laughs> um, the plan itself, I'm not so sure on. No, Ooh, I'm gonna give it an eh. Look, I just, I just can't not give Jackie Chan a thumbs up. So I'm kind of, I'm between a rock and a hard place. But um, yeah, the plan itself, not, not great. But um, I think the, yeah, the. The movie itself, like, it's enjoyable. I remember enjoying it. I'm really keen to rewatch it. But, yeah, probably not the greatest plan in the world. No. Mm, I really, really enjoyed this movie, so thumbs up. And at the same time, I think I, you know, I would fall prey to this plan. Because, you know, if I just drank, I I would uh, unsuspectingly drink that water. And I'd be like, oh, I'm dying now. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, this is life. Oh, this Goodbye. is it. Goodbye. Why am I getting world. more thirsty? Oh, I'm drying up. Oh, I'm dead now. Bye-bye. Bye bye. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, you know, media about biologic weapons are doing okay. Mm. So, should we move on to our plans? Let's do it. Yes, let's, let's move it. on to the plan. So, everyone, uh, my plan is to use the weaponization of hay fever to take over the world. You're an you're an evil person, Ken. <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, like it's already I, I, taking over the world for some people. <laughs> like, <laughs> Ah, uh, this plan was inspired by my friend Daniel, who has very, very severe hay fever that basically stops him from going out every now and then. So, you know, it's pretty hectic. Is this just a plan to make his life more <laughs> miserable? Like, and then just get other people in the in, in the meantime? I, I mean, I'm thinking it's going to be like his level. That's where I'm going to get like people to. Oh, she's going to really piss people off. Yeah, basically. Okay. I can just imagine Daniel listening to this and being like, I know there's only a really small chance that he'd ever do this, but even so, just to be sure. <laughs> Never hangs out with Ken again. Okay, so what's the plan? Uh, guys, I've done my research, you know, like, okay, so produce um, a type of flower um, with pollen that everyone is allergic to. Bam. Okay, 100% allergies, like, spiked right up. Currently, it's yep. at 18 Plutonium's for... a good choice, then. <laughs> Plutonium. Uh, yeah, no, basically, you know, hay fever, anyone who's experienced it, you know, stops you from uh, doing your work, stops you from going to school, or at least concentrating, you know, and messes up with your sleep as well. Mm. You know, with this amazing new uh, destructive uh, pollen from this uh, flower, I think um, I'd be able to take over the world by taking the world hostage uh, okay. through hay fever. Okay, question, yeah. question for you. Yes, yes, yes. Why are you not allergic to it 
Oh, oh well. You don't get high on your own supply, Emma. Come on. Exactly. No, but I'm just saying if the whole world is getting, you know, fucked up with his pollen, hundred percent of people, that includes mm. you, Ken. Yes, that is true. <laughs> it's the price he's willing to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, yeah, no, um, I also suffered from um, hay fever um, so every now and then. So, yes, I understand the pain. Uh, but, you know, that means I understand everyone else's pain as well. So, that means I'd be a pretty great leader, right? So, you, you're <laughs> just making everyone in the world, including yourself, suffer. Mm. Do you have a cure for this? Like, what? Like, what's the, how are you dominating the world? Okay, here comes the second part of my plan. All right. <laughs> So, how will I spread this pollen apart from just flowers? You know, flowers need places to grow and you know, it's difficult. So, what would I use to carry these flowers? Bees! Bees? Yes, bees. Okay. You know, um, so they feed on nectar and pollen. So, I'm going to get them. Uh, so, these are like genetically engineered bees. And um, they would be under my control as I will be their uh, queen bee. Mm -hmm. Yep. And right. uh, that will basically collect pollen with their wings and fly off to my enemies and blast blast the pollen in the, uh, at their faces. And they have um, a cure uh, to uh, hay fever. Some people say honey uh, would fix hay fever. Ooh. Mm. Oh, I see what ah, you did there. See. Okay. So, obviously, I would take this honey until I am immune to this hay fever. And I would also... <laughs> Just... <laughs> Trade this with all my other friends uh, who uh, I do not want to be affected. Such as you, Daniel. Looking out for you, buddy. Well, no, because your whole plan was to just screw up his world. <laughs> Ken's just pleading not to be killed by Daniel. <laughs> the whole plan started to mess with him even more. So I Whoa. Don't... No, let's mess with people like him. Like him. Not specifically him. Exactly. mess with Daniel. Exactly, exactly. I mean, he's... I mean, his heavy was so bad, he can't get worse. So, I'm really doing him a favour. I, look, I, I, I get the plan and that, you know, everybody's going to be suffering from this hay fever, but how do you take over the world? Here's the good bit, and this is where I think I can help you out. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> We're joining this in on plans. This may be to my own detriment later. <laughs> yeah, what you, what you do is you pull a... You know, a classic switcheroo. You, in secret, be the one that's threatening everyone, but then you also, in public, be like, I have the cure <gasps> if you'll only give me a trillion dollars. Oh, my God. Yes, that was my plan all along. Totally uh, didn't just steal that. No. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. I have leverage, guys. Oh, if I have a villain lair, I would call it the hive. Fuck yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll give you that one. Yay. All right, so my plan is... You know, a, a long, long-standing plan. It's going to take me quite a few years to kind of, you know, create it and put it into place. But um, it's essentially me being in my own kind of little world, growing livestock, vegetation, all the kind of things, basically creating my own little society. I'm kind of thinking of um, what Julianne Moore in um, Kingsman Golden Circle has and how she's kind of in her oh, own, no. little, oh, yeah. awesome own little island. island kind of thing. Is that there. the second time this has come up on this, step, <laughs> yeah. on this show? It's a great I, film. She's a great <laughs> villain. You know, she's got a... She she's is got a great an, villain. Private Why did island? we need an Elton John movie? That was basically the <laughs> Elton John movie. <laughs> but basically, that's the kind of, um, I guess, society that I have in my head. Like, she's in her own world. She's got everything she needs up there. Um, so... Think that, but on a much larger scale with livestock, okay. vegetation, all that kind of stuff. So everything that you could need for a society. Um, so obviously that would take a few years to kind of get it going. I'll have a few people there helping to tend and that sort of thing. Um, but then what will be happening around the world is that the waterways um, will be contaminated. Then the, um, the animal populations will be poisoned as well. So thinking things like mad cow, let's get like E. coli and salmonella into things like that's just get it all out there so once the animal populations are gone or contaminated um obviously people can't eat those because then they will then you know mad cow that can be spread to humans with the contaminated meat with the vegetation and things like that obviously through the waterways mm -hmm. with watering them and things like that then people can't eat those and where's the only safe place me in my world Mm -hmm. My society. In your underwater lair. <laughs> it's not an underwater <laughs> lair this time. We're above ground on my own island. But basically that is the safe haven going to start society again and I will be in charge. Okay. And that's my plan. And you're above underwater Damn lair. Damn it, I was about to say that, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just my lair. Yeah. 
<laughs> my island, whatever it is, where this is, don't know. But that's the plan. Is basically starting over again, but with me at the top. Okay. Okay. So my plan is kind of similar to Ken's plan, but it's also kind of similar to the tuxedo. So it's kind of a great film. I've kind of mer- get it. Yeah, I've kind of I've kind of merged two pieces of the great classics of Western literature, the tuxedo. And a book that I read in year six called The Cockroach War. <laughs> it clearly had an impression, left an impression on you. Yeah. I, Sounds like I a can remember great it. book. Oh, it's a great book. I remember it to this day, so it clearly must have been good. But the plot of this book is this family wins millions of dollars in the lottery and they like redo their house and like just become complete assholes because of all of this money. And the kids who live next door to them, who used to be quite good friends with like the neighbor kids and like, you know, the whole family's become like assholes now, including the kids. Money will do that to you. Yeah. The sister makes these robotically controlled cockroaches that like they use to swarm over like the parties that the other family has at their new house. <laughs> oh, wow. Just because they're sour just... about not being invited. <laughs> yeah, they are. And so they like, they become basically bioterrorists <laughs> with these like hordes of cockroaches that like swarm over the parties. Where are they getting the money to do this? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's not even your plan. I'm just poking holes in the book. (laughs) I don't like cockroaches are free. (laughs) Anyway, okay. Uh, But yeah, so my plan is very similar to this. But what we're going to do is we're going to infect cockroaches, these robotically controlled cockroaches, with some plague. I don't know. That's we'll figure. You know, the boffins will figure that out later. (laughs) But we're going to infect these cockroaches with some sort of plague and then threaten to use them against cities if they don't pay us an exorbitant ransom. The beauty about using cockroaches is you can't kill them by cutting off their heads. You can't stomp on them. They can fit through any sort of gap. They're immune to nuclear weapons, so that's, you know, off the table. They're the perfect weapon. Fuck those fucking water striders. Cockroaches, man. (laughs) Oh, my bees are useless against this. All right. Okay. So why can't we stomp on them? I mean, you can try. Oh, and then this plague would spread from his dead body. <laughs> Sounds bodies. like a challenge. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. It's the perfect plan. Oh. Yeah, right. Oh, no. <laughs> so, thank you, Jonathan Harlan, for your wonderful book, The Cockroach War. Wait, was that book more PG than your plan? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, that was just about ruining parties and you're, you're about, like, killing everyone. In the book, it's just about ruining parties and, like, giving some, like, rude people their comeuppance. I'm, like, using it to, you know, murder Start cities. the plague again? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we should vote on who won that round. My vote goes for Ken this round. My vote goes for Jim this round. Yes! Because I'm fucking giving him everything he wants if he's threatening me with, like, plague-infested cockroaches. Hell yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I feel like I, I probably have to vote for one of you then. I can't vote for myself. <laughs> Because, I mean, I like my plan because everybody's living in a peaceful world afterwards as opposed to both of you. Everybody's either got hay fever or got the plague. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mine, everybody's just hungry and then we all go live in a peaceful society together. Oh, Mm -hmm. damn it. Oh, so wholesome. So what are you voting? It's the first time in my life I've been wholesome. I was very mindful after (laughs) last week. (laughs) (laughs) So who are you voting for, Emma? Uh, I really want to vote for myself. Am I allowed to vote for myself? I feel like that's not in the spirit of things. Fine. Otherwise, I would have voted for myself. Um, I feel like I have voted for myself in the past, just by the way. Um, All right, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll vote for Jim's because I feel like there's a (laughs) bit more thought. (laughs) behind it as opposed to Ken's just like screwing everybody over it's not really a way to fix it that, that, I mean really... like everyone's mildly uncomfortable and they're more vulnerable to me yeah, oh that's god worse. I sound terrible I'm that's so worse. mean right now um, I mean I mean guys save the bees no <laughs> No, having hay fever, just that just sound and everybody do you imagine I hate going on to work on the train and just hearing everybody coughing and sneezing and all this kind of stuff. I don't want to have every single person near me, including myself, spluttering all over the place. But my villain that's gonna be called the hive. But no, oh. I agree. Yeah, no, um yeah, mine's pretty annoying. Yeah, yours is just annoying. <laughs> You guys, you guys, I did it. Congratulations, I did it, I Jim. won. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, man, no, congratulations, Jim. You congratulations, won this week. Congratulations, Jim. Thank you. 
I promise to be more magnanimous in my victory next time. Yeah, <laughs> next time. Oh. We'll see. If there ever is we'll a next see. time. We'll see. No, it was, oh. it was a good plan. Well won. Um, I still prefer my – I'm looking forward to pot the – possibility of living in my own little society in my own little world i'm picturing the water Thanos after the snap <laughs> oh, Just the very, in, oh the very nice in farm peace. in peace yeah no work no other people with their hay fever around <laughs> yeah fuck, be great fuck those people yeah. whoa you're at a farm great. you're gonna get hay fever yeah but i don't have yeah, hay if, fever oh don't you oh okay if those claritine ads have taught me anything is that people are willing to move to mars if it means getting away from hay fever oh, wow. yeah imagine with ken's bloody <laughs> super hay fever actually we might actually get to mars before the end of this decade <laughs> you're welcome society maybe that's what's holding elon musk back he doesn't have, he doesn't hay, have fever. hay fever <laughs> ken you need to spice elon musk with the pollen <laughs> oh my god i'm on it guys Actually, Emma, I'll have a question to ask you. Yeah. If you have a lovely haven like that, would you still poison everyone's water supply and try and take over the world? No, nah, probably not. Hey. Okay. Just checking. Okay. Just checking no. if you're a psychopath or not. Well, I passed. Okay. Did I pass? You did. You did. No, I feel like... Great job. Because one, in one of those scenarios, I get to live peacefully with myself and people that I like as opposed to... In the other situation, having to open it up to people and having oh, to deal okay. with people. Okay, Ugh. if I didn't tell you about my hay fever plan, would you let me live on your island? Look, I'd search you before you came onto the island. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> when did you bring hay fever what to the island? One of those seven oasis? wheelbarrows full of really fine dust. <laughs> What's in your pockets, Ken? Um, flowers for you. It's a trap. No, thank you. I grow my own. <laughs> Damn it. It's foolproof. Cool. Uh, thanks for listening to us, everyone, tonight. I've certainly had a blast. I hope these other two have. And we hope that you've had a blast I as well. I've got a buzz out of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, just, I just can't. I just... Oh. We made it so close. So close. Uh, next week's episode, we will be talking about chemical weapons. You know, just to lighten the mood a little bit. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> hope, hope to see you all then. Awesome. Thanks for another fun night, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Kenneth I Love Who It's signing off. Bye. Thanks for listening to World Domination. You can find links to all the things we talked about, our other episodes, or leave us a voice message at anchor.fm slash worlddomination. If you'd prefer to give us feedback in text form, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or email worlddompod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show... Make sure to tell your mum about it.